good. And I just want to take the opportunity to thank anybody who's involved in that music ministry and say you're doing a really blessed work. Okay, so I, I realize time pressure, and I'm also oh, okay. And I'm also aware that when I when I gave Eric all the note, she said, "Wow, that's long." Uh, but it's not actually, trust me, it's not. I've just had to do really big print uh, because I can't see so well. And uh, also, I, I don't want to deviate from my notes, so I've kind of written everything down because deviation is not necessarily a good thing. On Wednesday night, a uh, few of us from the Wednesday um, uh, house group, we went to uh, Renee and Bridget's, and I was congratulating myself because I'd actually arrived 10 minutes early, or at least that's when I passed the, the entrance to their place just a little turning now to get to the car park and I don't know what happened but I found myself on the highway heading back home <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and that's how it is in Hong Kong if you make a mistake it's really hard to turn back so um, I don't want to deviate now this morning so when Pastor Rene asked me if I'd be willing to speak I was unsure at first most of you know that I'm retiring I've been in Hong Kong 16 years now 16 amazing years living and working here but finally I've retired I've been preparing for that now well, I suppose mentally preparing for it uh, since I last si uh, signed my last contract uh, two years ago, but physically preparing for it uh, a few months ago when I packed up all my boxes. It's amazing, you know, when I came to Hong Kong, I came with a case, a carry-on, and three metal boxes, and so I don't know where all this other stuff came from, <laughs> but it, it's had to go back, and I... I, I Every time I open a cupboard, there's still something else in there. I'm just very thankful that Amy's still in the apartment so I can just forget about it tonight and leave. So it's, uh, it's, it's great uh, to actually be finally going to be on my way. But I'm no great fan of traveling, I have to say. I like to go places. I love to go places. But I hate the traveling part. I like to get from A to B, and I like it to be done as fast as possible. I don't like deviations. I don't like delays because of mechanical uh, failure or the weather or anything like that. Uh, I don't like multiple stopovers. I, I avoid those. I just don't want any plans to change. I want to go from A to B. Now, we often hear people referring to life as a journey and going through a process. <laughs> it's nice. The Heavenly music. Stretching. Heavenly music. <laughs> And so retiring has got me thinking about my own personal journey. Uh, and so it's those thoughts that I'd like to share with you now. And I've said on the whole, I prefer things to go smoothly when I'm making a journey. And most of my traveling experiences have been good and been positive. There's been one or two hiccups, but mostly okay. But that's where the similarity ends. When we think about our journey through life, we, our expectation is when we go on a regular journey, it's going to be fine. And our expectation in life shouldn't necessarily be that everything's going to be fine. Uh, because Jesus himself said in John chapter 6, 33, in the world you will have troubles. He didn't say you might have troubles or it's possible you'll have troubles. He said you will have trouble. Uh, and he wanted them to experience peace in that trouble. But for sure you're going to have trouble. And I, I can... I can pretty much guess that most of us in this room have had some sort of trouble. If you haven't, you need to get yourself prepared because you will have trouble. <laughs> so looking at the big picture and thinking about these troubles or these interruptions that we experience, sometimes they come as part of an evolving plan. Uh, my own transition, my, my retirement, this big change that's affecting me, I, I've, I've seen it coming. I've seen it coming, and so I, in some way I've been able to prepare, but sometimes troubles come unexpectedly. We don't expect them to come. It could be in the form of sickness, ourselves, someone that we love. It could be in the form of losing your job. It could be in the form of suddenly finding your income's dried up, and you're expecting to provide for your family, but now you can't provide for yourself. These are interruptions, and they're very real interruptions in our journey. So when we're taking a journey, we have to prepare. Uh, and like I said, we want to get from A to B with minimum hassle. Um, but when interruptions come, how do we respond? What do we do? Now, if you look at a real journey, think about yourself. Has anybody had an interrupted journey, a real journey on a plane or a train? 
<laughs> right. So how do you respond? Do you get agitated? Do you get annoyed? Do you wish you'd chosen another route? Do you wish you'd chosen another airline? <laughs> so how we respond has a direct effect on how comfortable we'll be for the rest of the journey. You know, are you going to sit beside a person and say, you'd have thought they'd have done something about that. You should have had a meal voucher. There should have been something. It's, there's all sorts of things happen there. It affects how we continue on that journey. But also it affects what shape we're in when we get to the other end. It's not, hi, it's nice to see you. Wow, that was an awful journey. I hated that. <laughs> Never going with that airline again. So it affects how we are. And I, I think that that's the same in our spiritual journey. Um, it, how we respond to these interruptions, these transitions, is going to affect how we continue the rest of the journey. And it will certainly affect what shape we're in when we arrive at the other end. So last week, Pastor Rene shared about being set free and staying free. And I think that our responses and our attitudes in times of transition are crucial to being able to stay free. Uh, Rene drew our attention to Galatians 5 and he said that we have a responsibility of choice when we're faced with difficult situations. How we respond, that's our choice. So I'd like to take a look at some people in transition, uh, people in very difficult circumstances. And it, it's difficult for me now because the only Bible that's not packed away is this one, it's tiny, tiny print. So I'm gonna try. Uh, it's a people in transition. No, it's okay, because I know where it is on here. I can focus. <laughs> <laughs> a people in transition. How did they respond? Okay, so it says, the rabble, that's not very nice to start with. The rabble, it's a uh, verse, oh, that's too small, uh, Jennifer, I can't tell you. It's about a half an inch down. Uh, <laughs> I think, is it uh, verse five, I think, maybe? Four or five. It says the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started walking and said, if only we had meat, well, oh, we're not walking, wailing, wailing. I suppose they were walking as well as the wilderness, but they were wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost with the, also the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions and garlic but now we've lost our appetite and we never see anything but this manna. And then Moses, this is not just a few people because Moses heard the people of every family wailing each at the entrance to his tent. They're in transition. They've been set free. They've got a huge, huge promise of moving into the promised land but they're in transition and they're complaining. And we know that's only one example of their complaining. They're remembering the free food, the leeks, the garlic, the garlic, the melons. It's quite a glossy picture really that they're painting to support a complaint. They seem to be conveniently forgetting the beatings, the brick making, all of those other things that we read about that they were suffering and crying out to the Lord for. Um, so, Faced with the hardship of the journey, they were complaining and they were looking back with a distorted view of what they'd been rescued from and what they'd left behind. It wasn't that God wasn't providing for them because he was. The manna was an amazing daily provision that was in itself a miracle. But instead of looking ahead to all that they'd been promised, they were looking back and they were focusing their attention on the past. And the problem was that meant they weren't really able to embrace th the promise that was to come. Thinking about my own journey, retirement and moving home, though it's been a super busy time, it's actually been a precious time for remembrance and reflection. I find myself looking back at 16 very happy years. I can recall many great memories that will stay with me, but I'm conscious that it's a journey and in order to move on successfully, I need to embrace this period of transition. So when the Israelites look back at their distorted view of the past, it contributed to their complaints about their current situation, but more than this, it actually had an effect on their future. You see, when Moses received instruction from the Lord to send out men to explore the promised land, do you remember the spies went out, the 12 spies? 
He sent 12 men out and they spent 40 days exploring the place and they came back and Numbers 13 and 26 gives us that report. It says, when they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran, there they responded to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They actually brought fruit back, the plentiful fruit there. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. But, but, the people who live there are powerful. The cities are fortified and very large. They'd seen giants and it had put fear into them. They weren't em able to embrace that. I found it was quite interesting that, you know, when you look at that first occasion when they're in the wilderness, that uh, they, with the complaining, they, they elevated the, what they perceived as good things of Egypt and they suppressed the bad things and it kind of uh, helped them with their complaint. But here we find in, in this experience, they're elevating the bad things and suppressing the good things. And it actually kind of paralyzes them. They're stuck. So uh, the poor choice that they made, because the choice that they made was to ignore Caleb and to ignore Joshua, who were super keen and said, let's go for it, let's go in, we can do this. They, they actually remained paralyzed in their situation. And we're told they wandered around in the desert for 40 years, a journey that could have and should have taken just a few days. In fact, their poor choice led to some of those people, we're told that the, anybody that was uh, a, able to fight didn't actually get to set foot on that land. Uh, so poor choice led to that. So I find myself looking forward to what happens next. And I realize that although I have some tentative plans and ideas, and they are very tentative plans and ideas, there's more uncertainty than planning about what lies ahead. And I know that many of you will have similar uncertainties for, for whatever reason. You're in a transition. Uh, you're not certain about the future. You're not sure how to view it. Um, maybe it's, it's health. Maybe it's finance. There could be a million and one things. We're all going through different kinds of transition. And you're wondering what next? You're imagining scenarios. Some might be very positive, some might be very negative. So looking into the future or looking at the future, I was reminded that we've got some amazing promises in a period of transition that we should remind ourselves of. John 14 uh, verse 2 says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and I'll take you to myself so that where I am, you might be also. Here's another one in 1 John chapter three. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him. We shall see him as he is. Revelations 22 verse three, we'll see him face to face. Revelations 21, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things are passed away. Great words of encouragement, all of them, as we look into the future. That for many of us is uncertain in many ways. We can be sure of those promises. And there are many more promises. I'm sure you, you can all give examples of things that, that have really jumped out of the Bible and, and you've grasped that and thought, wow, that's a great promise. And it comes to you again and again. And that's great for the future. But what about our present circumstances? We're in transition. We might be suffering physically, emotionally, spiritually, when we're disappointed maybe, maybe confused, feeling the weight of our current circumstances. And those promises, amazing as they are, seem way, way out there. Yes, there's gonna be a feast, there's gonna be a banquet one day, something to look forward to. But what about today? What is our daily manner? Because we are in a bit of a wilderness if we're in a transition. In our present circumstances, look back look back. Do we look back and wish it wasn't like this? Or do we look back and see God was working there and it can do it again?
It's our choice. It's our choice what we do. Transition is hard, but I think we can learn a lesson from Joshua in his transition as he prepared to finally leave the desert and cross the Jordan River. Now, when I looked at the life of Joshua, it was a young man, but you know, he, he was a slave in Egypt. He was there. He was a young man, a slave in Egypt. He had witnessed firsthand the crossing of the sea. He, had, he was one of the spies that was sent out and, and saw that promised land and wanted to go in and get it. Um, he, he was one of the two spies that wanted to go in and get it, but was disappointed and was left because of everybody else overruling them that was left wandering around for 40 years. Um, so Joshua and Caleb, they wanted to go in but were overruled by the majority. It wasn't their choice. He had the opportunity to look back and see on all of those things that had happened. He'd served with Moses as his assistant. He'd heard God's voice. He'd heard the complaints of the people. He'd seen the miracles. He'd seen the promised land. And he waited patiently for 40 years. I don't, I'm not sure I could wait patiently for 40 years in a transition. <laughs> but, uh, but what a disappointment to endure that longer transition. Yet it was a transition that took him from being Moses' assistant to being a great leader. That's what happened for him in the transition. A lot of those other people might have spent those 40 years complaining and wishing and hoping and all the other things. But he was in transition of changing from an assistant into a mighty leader. And do you ever wonder what he's thinking as he waited to cross over and finally take the land? We can get some ideas just from those first verses in Joshua. Joshua 1 says, the Lord says, be strong and courageous. It's verse 6. Verse 7, the Lord said, be strong and very courageous. Verse 9 says, have I not commanded you? to be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified. Don't be discouraged. It indicates to me that probably he wasn't feeling really sure of himself, but he was relying on God. God was, wasn't just telling him to pull himself together, but to trust and to rely and to have confidence in God. And this is the reason, I think, this is the key point. Verse 9 tells us, For the Lord your God will be with you, wherever you go. That's the key point. And doesn't that remind you of a verse in Matthew 28, 20? Jennifer, do you know what that is? Matthew 28, 20? Surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. That's a present promise. That's our daily manna. Right? It's not for the future. Future promises are great. But this is our daily manna. Um, Moses he was uncertain of his ability, and he was told, I will be with you. Isaac, in a time of famine, and he was wondering what he should do and where he should go. Genesis 26, God says, stay where you are, live where you are, and I will be with you. Gideon was presented with the task of saving Israel. Gideon, who was actually hiding from the Midianites, doing out his his daily task, was told he was a mighty warrior, right? And he felt he wasn't up to the challenge of what God wanted him to do. The Lord called him a mighty warrior. And looking at this account, we can see it took him a while to accept that fact. He had a, he had a transition, accepting who he was, who God said he was, and what God said he would do. But God said he was going to be with him. We have other promises as well that are specific to our daily portion, our manner, if you like, present promises. I'm sure you can, you can give me some, but it's things like, I will supply all your need. I will answer you when you call. Has anybody else got some favorite ones? You got a favorite one? I'm sure you have. I'm sure you've got favorite ones, your daily manner. Uh, something that you knew that God was speaking to you and through that promise, giving you the strength to rejoice in the fact that you've been set free and empowering and inspiring you to commit to staying free, to making those right choices. So if we're in transition, how are we doing? Are we looking back 
with nostalgia or regret? Or are we looking at the transition as an opportunity to move on in our relationship with the Lord? Getting ready to enter a new season in our walk with him. Having a fresh revelation and a new understanding of who he is. You know, when God met Moses, when, when God met Joshua, uh, they were told, this is, this is holy ground that you're standing on. This place of transition is, is a place where you're humbled before God, and it's a place of holy ground. And that's the same for us. Why should it be different for us? It's the same for us. So the main thing is to realize you are a work in progress. All of us, we're a work in progress. And God isn't finished with us yet. I'm retiring, but God is, the, the education system might be finished with me, but God is not. We're a work in progress. Don't look back with nostalgia. Remember what God has done for you. Look back and see that. Know for sure that he can, and he will do it again. And know that your attitude and your response during a time of transition is actually a mighty witness to the God we serve. In a, doing a general sort out of my things, I came across a note which I'd obviously written to myself some years ago, one of these scrap pieces of paper that you keep, but you never look at. But I did look at it the other day. And I don't remember exactly uh, what it was, but it obviously referred to some period of transition. And it was just a very short note, and it says, I resist the potter's hand so many times. And when pressed, I fail to understand the gentle pressure of his hand is assurance that his work in me is yet to be complete. Um, and that, that came to me afresh, actually, just reading that. Sometimes we begin a work and we get overwhelmed by the complexity of the task. And we have a tendency to give up. But God promises he's not going to give up. This is one of my favorite present future verses. Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Where he's begun a good work in you, he will complete it, no matter how complex the task. And many of us are very complex. So he will complete it. You may feel like giving up, but he won't. He set us free, and he's fixed on helping us stay free. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his reputation, because of his name, because of who he is. So I'd just like us to pray. Yeah. Father God, we thank you because of who you are and for what you've done. We thank you that you have set us free. We thank you that you have a plan to keep us free and that you empower us to be free. Father, when we're going through periods of transition, Help us not to be despondent or despair, but help us to look to you. We thank you for the amazing promises that you've given us in the future, that one day we'll be with you, one day we'll be like you. Father, that you'll wipe every tear away. We won't have any of the worries that we've got. But Father, we thank you for now that you give us very precious daily manna. And the key of that is that you have promised that you will never leave us and that you will always be with us. We thank you that you've been with us today. We've seen that through the worship, the different songs that we've sung. Uh, that song that when we see you, we find strength to face the day. So we pray, Father, that today our eyes will be open to see you. Our hearts will be open to receive you. And, Father, that we will be a, a mighty witness for the way that we go through the different transitions that we face. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay.